one of the things that a, that a developer can do to make sure that their project is bankable, if you like, is actually contract or employ a couple of the professionals such as your valuer and your QS and employ them in the early stages actually helping you with your feasibility. You are listening to the Property Developer Podcast, your home for tips, ideas and inspiration to help take your developing to the next level. Now here's your host, Justin Getty. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Property Developer Podcast. As always, it is wonderful to have you with me. Plenty to cover in this show. We speak with past guest and finance specialist Gail Stapleton about funding and lending. And more about that in a moment. If you listened into the last episode, you will have heard how I was on my way to bid at an auction for my next development project after satisfying my due diligence checklist. I turned up at the auction quietly confident of being the last person with their hand up in the air. It was a well attended auction and there was an incredible number of bids. It must have been over 50 bids along the way. And when the hammer fell, it wasn't my hand that was up in the air, it was someone else's. In fact, I didn't even make a bid in the end as the price crept up to and then beyond my limit, so I had to watch from the sidelines. In the end, the property sold for about $80,000 more than I was prepared to pay. I was disappointed to miss out, but I quickly moved on and found another site last week which looked awesome and was freshly listed. So I moved very quickly to assess the site, work out how many we could get on it, and then made a strong offer well above the asking price to try and pull the property off the market before they had any open for inspections. So I signed up the contracts and put our offer forward with a deadline for 5pm on the Friday, and this quickly flushed out another buyer who also put in an offer for the property. At around 6pm on the Friday night, I got a call from the agent informing me that we had been unsuccessful and had been bested by about $60,000. So again, that was pretty disappointing and shows that the Melbourne market is still running pretty hot. Anyway, that's developing life, so the search goes on. I'll keep you posted if I manage to snare anything. On to today's show. I speak again with finance specialist Gail Stapleton. Gail is a former long-time bank executive who left the dark side and now runs her own finance business called Stapleton Pacific. Gail was instrumental in helping us secure our funding package for our current development. In this chat, we discuss the current lending landscape, take a deeper look at valuation and quantity surveyor reports, and cover some of the different types of debt and funding options out there. I started off by asking Gail if a movie was made about her life, which movie star would play the leading role? Let's say Julia Roberts. (laughs) (laughs) Only because I like Julia Roberts and I saw saw a recent um, um, ad for her most recent uh, movie. Yeah. Don't ask me why I've chosen Julia Roberts. (laughs) A pretty woman maybe. Yeah, she's a good choice. (laughs) She's actually... uh... A very talented actress, I would say. She is, yes. Well, I think she'd do a pretty good job playing you. Thank you. I'll <laughs> take that as a compliment. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, on with the show. We've got a lot to cover today. So, I was going to go over some of the more detailed um, content that was in the valuation report and the quantity surveyors report that were done for our project um, and talk about how some of those things are important for developers to be aware of some of the different lending options that are available and how you can go about perhaps structuring them or the implications of them. But before we get to that, it's been a couple of months since you were last on the show and as you predicted, it's been pretty fluid out there. So what's your take on the current lending landscape? Uh, Well, I think the the word fluid is uh, in bold letters at the moment. There is um, continuing uncertainty and uh, concern, I think, in the development space, um, particularly uh, within the 5K radius of the cities. But um, I actually had a a meeting with the commercial lending team yesterday uh, from one of the major banks, and they were saying that certainly in Brisbane, um, the development uh, space is, is, you know, under micromanagement, if you like, and it doesn't matter um, where it is in in the Brisbane area, uh, it's not just within that 5k radius, 
and the main concerns now is around settlement risk. A number of the projects have obviously been approved um, and at various stages of development, but with the changes in lender appetite for investors and in more particularly foreign non-residents, the concern is what impact will that have on the settlement of these transactions. And that, that aspect or that risk hasn't been tested yet. So um, there, there is a, a high level of uncertainty and, um, and watching brief. And I think over the next 12 months, it will be uh, a very interesting uh, environment to, to monitor. Yeah, I was reading the other day a quite interesting article that said that some of the other finance institutions would step in and create products that would service those buyers which would potentially alleviate that situation? Well, if you're talking about the investor markets, the residential, the Australian investor market, um, I think, uh, well, only this week actually, um, one of the major banks being Westpac, have actually made, um, improved their package offering for that investor segment. So I think um, the Australian investor, I think will be pretty well covered. Um, it is the foreign non-resident. Um, uh, segment. Uh, so these are the, the non-Australian citizens who um, who don't live in Australia. Um, you know, typically the Asian market, um, and there is only about four players in that market now. The the major banks have pulled out, and part of the reason for them pulling out is from a risk management point of view. What they've found is the some of these investors. Um, when they've provided information for the loan application, they've found that that information is not correct. Now, it's not that these um, investors and borrowers are actually demonstrating um, uh, any stress in their repayments. In actual fact, they're repaying their loans very well. Um, but a number of them were potentially self-employed and then and but completed applications as if they were um, PAYG. So that's caused some concern uh, with the major banks. Um, so they are wanting to actually manage through that process and see exactly what risks they're looking at uh, before they actually put their toe back in the water. But you do have a, a number of you know, smaller, second tier, more specialist lenders that are still playing in that space. For example, Latrobe Financial is one, uh, Resimax another one, uh, Citibank is also still playing in the space. So there is still lenders, um, so to meet that market and what they've, what those smaller lenders have found is they're getting very, very busy. Uh, and I think you're right in that this, whenever there is a gap in the market, um, some you know, some, some smart player will come in and say, well, look, we will fill that niche. And now who knows? It could even be, um, it could even be um, a, an Asian-based lender because a lot of the foreign non-residents do, are coming from Asia. And let's face it, um, a lot of the Asian um, investors actually don't necessarily need to borrow the money. Mm -hmm. They can always get the money um, from their home country, albeit there are exchange control issues that can cause problems there as well. Yeah, well, I was talking to someone the other day who was saying that quite a few of the banks are sort of doing a dollar in, dollar out now. So they're waiting for projects to finish and settle before they'll then release that capital back into another project. Well, that's exactly right. Um, and you know, because they've all got caps. They've got, uh, they had caps on uh, how much of their portfolio growth could be in the investor, residential investor segment, and they've also got caps on their development segment. Um, and that is exactly what's happening. Uh, as one development completes, um, there are funds available for the next one. But what they, what you are finding is that the, is the developments they're funding are existing clients. So new, so, a new developer with zero experience would find it very difficult now to actually get funding. Oh, very interesting. Yes, yeah, so uh, you have uh, been well-timed for you. 
in the last 12 months. Yeah, well, it was interesting because you and I had a conversation a couple of months ago, actually when we signed our loan documents and I asked you whether you would uh, just stick with one bank and build a solid relationship with them or whether you would look to try and have multiple banks that you had relationships with and which one would you suggest we follow? And you said, well, the issue is if you go with one bank and they change their lending criteria, you're stuck. Which Absolutely. Which is kind of where I guess quite a few people probably are at the moment. Yes, uh, I think that's right. Um, and, you know, we, when we covered the reasons why, uh, you can have a relationship with a, um, you know, a, a property specialist in one of the major banks and, and they can buy into your strategy and your business plan but there'll be decisions made beyond them that they have got no control over. Uh, and so it's, it actually makes sense to uh, develop relationships with more than one uh, more than one lender. And this is also where you see some of the, what I talk about, the second tier or the smaller uh, product specialists come in. You have, there's a number of um, commercial property uh, consultants and lender specialists that are entering the market and clearly the interest rates are higher for those groups however um, this is where when you look at a project you've got to actually um, be considering all aspects now um, and not have it solely in your mind that I can only get funding through a, through a major bank. Yes I was just having that very conversation again with someone the other day about that maybe expanding yeah. your thinking beyond just getting relatively cheap finance through major banks and then looking at yeah. some of your secondary options and perhaps just accepting that you have to pay more for capital. That's right and so that just that just forms part of your feasibility. Yeah and so yeah. I guess that's a, a segue into some of the other options that may be available to developers looking beyond the major four banks yeah, well, okay, so you've got your, um, in terms of your funding structure, um, you have your, your senior, senior debt scenario, which is your major banks, but it's also some of your, your second tier or smaller banks, they're still classified in a, as a senior debt um, provider, and when I say your second tiers, you'd be looking at somewhere, I mean, Latrobe Financial, for, for example, is one that, um, that gets involved in the in the commercial development space. Um, another one is um, Adelaide Bank has actually played in that space as well. Suncorp and BOQ, Bank of Queensland, um, you know, jump in and out of it, albeit um, more so in Queensland for those for those banks. Um, so that's you have your senior bank, senior banks, or senior debt, I should say. And then the next um, option of funding is what they call either junior debt or mezzanine finance. Um, now that at times it can be provided by the um, by the major banks, but it's typically a a smaller uh, niche player that will provide that um, what they call junior debt, and that is typically um, a second mortgage. And then you have your preferred equity, um, which is um, an equity. Uh, equity provider that requires a coupon or an interest rate as well as a share of profit and then finally you have your the equity from the developer so there's four uh, there's four different options but typically your um, your junior debt um, only comes in when the uh, development is ready to go and what I mean by that is you've got the property and you've got the relevant permits and then it's time to actually seek the funding for the the actual development. Typically, your um, junior debt um, or mezzanine finance isn't available for um, for a land purchase, for example. Okay. And then, and of course, the interest rates for those different tiers um, becomes the higher the risk, um, the higher the expected return. And then what's the interplay between, say, senior debt, which would be, let's just say it's held by a major bank, 
Yep. Would they, um, they would obviously have some interest in how, what the rest of the funding structure looks like, but what's the sort of interplay with that? The senior debt is just funded by the bank and then the junior debt you kind of source and if the bank thinks it's okay, then away you go? Yeah, look, this is, and I, th I think it's a really good question. I, I think this is where um, the developer, it's very important for the developer to sit down with their finance specialist um, at the outset because it needs to be a holistic approach uh, on the funding. Um, there'll, be, there'll, be a, there'll be some occasions where the senior debt provider will say, we will not agree to a second mortgage. So therefore, your mezzanine finance type arrangement wouldn't work. Uh, so it needs to be looked at in one at the outset in a in a total solution, finance solution. And when you talk about second mortgage, um, I know what a first mortgage is. That's when the bank or whoever holds it gets first dibs at the sale proceedings. Yes. A, se what's the, a second mortgage is what whatever's left over. Yes, so the second, the second mortgagee gets pa paid after the senior debt provider. Okay. Yeah. And, and this is why um, you need to be talking to all of the lending people involved um, because the first mortgagee, or indeed the senior debt provider, needs to agree to the second mortgage. And so if they weren't involved from the outset and you just and you um, got your senior debt, fine, signed off, done, and then um, you signed your mortgage documents and then the mortgage documents were um, lodged in the relevant titles office and then the next minute there's a second mortgage to be registered. Well, the second mortgagee needs to inform the first mortgagee for the mortgagee to consent. And, and if the first mortgagee has, hasn't been advised of this, uh, there's a fair chance that the first mortgagee would, would pull the loan. Oh, okay. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm. So this is, I mean, one of the, one of the conditions you'll see in, your, um, in any uh, letter of offer is any significant change in financial circumstances. So that would be classified as, as, classified as significant change. Mm, okay. And, and all the, the senior debt, junior debt, mezzanine finance and your preferred equity, is, is that what's known as the capital stack? Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Oh, there yeah. you go. See, I have been doing some homework, Gail. You have. <laughs> as I said last time, you should be doing the interview yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did uh, set out to learn more about finance this year because it, um, it's a bit of a black, black art, I think. It's the, the terminology that gets thrown around and it's hard to get your head around. Yeah, I think it's the terminology that gets a bit scary. Yeah. Um, and of course, some people use slightly different terms. For example, junior debt, that's a fairly recent term, uh, whereas mezzanine finance has been around for quite some time. Um, so, you know, people come up with this, you know, um, sexy terms and people go, oh, what the hell that is? Yeah. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so this mystique can come across as being complicated. Yeah, well, I think the whole finance industry has been built on mystique to try and make it seem more uh, confusing than it actually is. Well, that could be the case, but I'm not going to comment on that one. No, that's <laughs> And so just going back to the, uh, with a preferred equity investor and you talked about a coupon or an interest yep. rate. Yes. Because I've heard someone talking about having a coupon rate before for providing money or yep. capital. Can you just explain to me how that works? Sure. I mean, each, uh, each deal will obviously be different. But when I say a coupon, you know, I mean an interest rate. And typically the uh, preferred equity provider would want um, an interest rate of anywhere between 12 and 15 percent uh, as well as a share of profit. And the interest rate um, would either be payable on a monthly basis but more likely it would be capitalised. Okay, yeah, I was wondering about that because I think in business investment it can be paid more regularly, can't it, monthly or quarterly? That's right. That's right, because you've got a um, you've got a consistent revenue stream. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was wondering about how that would work. Okay, so it would mostly capitalised. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, yeah, actually, I remember when I was looking, just casually looking around for finance, finance sorry, I was casually looking around for funding options way back and Latrobe did pop up and they had fairly relaxed lending conditions, I think, but they charged 10%, I think, for their, for their Yeah, loans. I mean, their interest rates probably are not quite at 10% now. They'd be, be, be looking at around about uh, eight, I'd say. Yeah. Their upfront costs are quite high as yeah, well. That's right, I remember um, that. And Latrobe um, wouldn't be interested in a first-time developer. Mm, okay. Yeah. I mean, you're, when you're looking at your, so okay, your senior debt providers at the moment, um, you're looking at potentially around about 6% oh, say by the time you've got your upfront fees as well. Uh, your um, senior debt providers that lend at a higher ratio, um, you'd be looking at perhaps 8%. Um, and then when you start to get into your um, junior debt mezzanine finance, it'll be plus, it'll be twenty plus percent. Um, and then you've got your then you've got your preferred equity, which is a coupon plus a share of profit. And each at each stage, there's also different upfront fees. For example, with the senior debt, your upfront fee might be something like 05 percent of the loan amount. Whereas um, as you go further up the food chain, um, it could be anywhere between two and a half to th you know three, three and a half percent. But you know, it, and this is why it's important to actually have that conversation and and at the outset of you know how we're going to structure this. What are the what are the different um, what are the different levels of capital that we're going to source? What's the funding? What are the interest rates so that you include it all in your feasibility and does it make sense? If yeah. it doesn't, you can watch your next one. Yeah, which is interesting that we're in a low interest rate environment, which technically means that cash or capital is cheaper, yet it's getting harder and potentially more expensive to access it from a development point of view. Well, I think it comes back to the return on equity that people need to have. Um, and as as something is deemed to be higher risk, they want a higher level of return. Um, and they've all got their cost of capital hurdles yeah. they need to achieve. And I mean, you know, the, 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 even the, the major banks with the development uh, transactions, I think you'll find that some of those margins um, will increase. Um, I mean, you know, the pricing was actually quite, uh, quite competitive. Um, you know, earlier this year, uh, that for for the risk, you know, having said that, the um, the major banks try, well, all the all the senior banks try to de-risk as much as possible, yeah. which is why they've been able to to date um, come up with reasonable pricing. Yeah. And actually, where do banks get all their money from? Do they actually source the actual capital that they? The bigger and then on sell. Yeah, well, obviously they've got their existing client base. Yeah. Um, but then they raise funds from the the wholesale market. Yeah. And uh, from the global market as well. But what? But the, where does the actual money come from? Is it countries or is it some wealthy Arab oil guy chucks in a hundred billion and says, "There you go." Oh. Uh, well, I. I no, I don't think it's an indiv individual player like that. Um, <laughs> where they actually get it from, I haven't actually been down to that detail with the banks, I must say. But it would be um, it would be your global fund managers that yeah. they would get their get their funding from. But also the banks, you'll see every now and again, they will um, raise funds um, by different capital instruments. They'll have certain what they call instalment warrants or uh, long term. Um, investment structures um, that's and that will be sourced within Australia as well as globally. Mm, yeah, I've always kind so of wondered where the investment bankers come in with all these different structures to to raise funds and fit with the different capital um, stack of the of the banks. Oh, okay, very good. 
Oh, you've used my you've used my term there already. I have. <laughs> see, you've taught me a new one. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by how money is actually created because these days it's just created by the flick of a button. Computers generating uh, money nowadays, credits. Yeah, well, thankfully we're not in America. No, that's true. That's a <laughs> conversation for another day. A uh, long bottle of wine, I think. Yes. Um, I actually also wanted to ask um, for you to clarify a little bit further on a couple of things that I found interesting when I was going through our loan application and the requirement that we had to get a valuation report done and a quantity surveyor's report done before the bank would um, formally approve our loan. And I wanted to ask you, A, why is that important? Um, and then B, some of the things that, that go into that, which I'll come to in a second. Okay. All right. Well, why it's important, it's one of the, um, one of the risk components of the of the bank's funding. When I talked to you about that the banks like to de-risk their applications as much as possible. And one of the risks, of course, is development risk. Um, is, you know, um, the developers come in and provided a feasibility based on certain costs and certain sale prices. And as part of their risk management, they need to validate that. And so the combination of the quantity surveyor and the valuer actually provides that uh, validation of the feasibility study, essentially. Um, and also, um, there are two fairly key ratios that the bank uses um, when they determine funding. And one of them is based on a loan to value ratio, which, is, which, is, which comes from the valuation report. And the other one is pay, based on um, loan to total cost ratio or total development cost um, and that um, really comes from the quantity surveyor. Um, so the quantity surveyor and the valuer work very closely. They are appointed at the same time but in a lot of, if you, if you want to think about it, um, really the QS has to complete his or her report before the valuer. Um, because it's the QS that confirms the actual costs and it's the valuer that really confirms the, the sale, the, the end value based on, okay, are the sale prices reasonable um, and is the time frame for sale reasonable. Okay, and then the margin between the two of those, what is that, what's that called? Let's say the valuer says it's the site value is 10 million and the quantity surveyor says the development cost is 8 million. So mm -hmm. that 2 million, what is that? Does the bank consider that to be profit yeah, before okay, cost? Yeah, okay, that is, that, yeah. Well, what they do is um, you've got a gross realisation value, which is, which is the sale prices, sale yep. price of the completed product, yep. uh, less commissions. Uh, less commissions and GST, yeah, okay. right? Um, and you've got your your total um, your total cost or your total project cost, um, and that is your land plus all your permits plus your um, your construction costs plus all your soft costs, so your professional fees um, plus your holding costs, so your interest interest costs. Um, and the construction cost is um, is excluding um, GST as well, and so the differential is the profit um, on, on the actual project. But that would yeah. okay. That would be what gro not gross gross profit or profit before costs or no no that would be that would be the return essentially that would be the profit. Okay. Um, because you've actually included all the costs, um, you've included all your interest costs, you've included all your holding, all your um, permits costs, your professional costs, yep. um, and a as a starting point, you've um, you, you've you've looked at your your net revenue. So it's the net revenue less all your costs, and that's going to be your profit. One of the things they look for is a minimum uh, profit ratio of around about twenty percent. Remember, we talked about that yep. uh, last time. Yeah. 
and uh, and the reason for that was because of the the higher deemed risk um, with with development um, projects. Um, one of the things that you might be interested in is the so they do a, an on completion value, which is based on that gross realization, and then they also do what they call a as is valuation. This is the valuer, and that's almost like a reverse. Um, almost like a reverse feasibility where they're, they start with again the gross income and they make actually they do make an allowance for profit uh, sorry a, a risk a risk allowance um, for when they end up with the um, value of the land as is they then they use a risk margin of anywhere between 20 and 30 percent so um, sometimes, for example, you'll have you'll buy a block of land at eight hundred thousand, for example, and then you'll get all your uh, professional costs, and then and they might have cost you two hundred thousand, but the market price, the market value is now two million, and so what you think when you're going to the bank is that okay, the bank will assess that potentially at one point eight million, the land, mm -hmm. the land with permits. With the DA, in other words, um, where in actual fact the bank will will actually value it at less than that because they'll take out a profit margin. And the reason why they do that is they want to make sure that you've got a minimum level of equity when you're going into the project, so that you're not so they're not actually lending against the the blue sky profit. They like to lend against um, a certain amount of that, but more lending against your hard contribution. Ah, so yeah, that, that's a good point because I had, guess I hadn't considered that they would make that assessment. Yeah, and I mean one of the things that a, that a developer can do um, to make sure that their project is bankable, if you like, is is actually take contract or employ a couple of you know employ, employ the professionals such as your valuer and your QS and employ them in the early stages actually helping you with with your uh, feasibility. In some ways you could argue that your architect and QS potentially are could be similar um, but certainly the value aside um, because they will then do that assessment on that reverse feasibility because um, that could be Something that um, causes a, a developer to, to trip up in their in their final valuation, in their final assessment, because they're saying, "Well, well, my minimum, your minimum equity component, you have in your mind, well, that's based on what the property, what the land is worth now. But if the if the bank doesn't assess it like that, um, then you don't reach that hurdle." Yes, that's right. Which is a really good point. Because mm. yeah, it's quite easy to go. Well, the the site's worth a million dollars, whereas the bank goes, actually, it's only we only think it's worth eight hundred, because we've had to subtract all these costs off if we then have to sell it. Or yeah, so yeah, yeah that's a, that's a good point. Because they look at it if the project's going to fall over, and they have to offload it, how can they get rid of it as quickly as possible, and what will they get for it? Well, that's right. Yeah. Which, as from the uh, as a developer, you. You're not really looking at thinking at it like that. It's like here's a great no. here's a great project that um, that I'm invested in and has great returns. And why don't just give us the money for it because it's great. Yeah. Well, see, like, yeah. I mean, your business is developing projects. The bank's business is lending money. Yeah. All right, and lending money and keeping the risk as low as they can. Mm. So the, uh, you know, different businesses. Okay, and so so there's a big difference between the project-related site value and the market value. Um, project-related site value in terms of the valuation, you mean? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that's because of that risk that risk margin. Okay, so should developers worry about these reports? I guess only if they're concerned that the valuations don't stack up. Well, I. Well, there are, two, there are two very key components of the uh, finance approval. Um, 
and yes, so they, they are important. Um, but I would be suggesting to, to developers is actually do your own research before the, the bank actually contracts these external professionals so that you have got a fair idea beforehand um, and then you know whether you're going to have a problem rather than thinking, okay, everything's cool, then all of a sudden the, the bank appointed valuation comes in significantly less than what you thought. Now, if that valuation does come in less than what you thought, there are a couple of options. Um, you can, of course, contribute for further funds. Um, you, um, you could look to bring in another equity provider. Um, or, or finally, you could, um, you could actually request another valuation. However, from what I've seen, it's very, very unusual for a second valuer to make, um, you know, a significant change from the first. Yeah. And so is a commercial valuation like that different to a residential valuation? Because yeah, I remember it's a lot when, digital. yeah, because I remember when we had our apartment in Elwood revalue or value, sorry, revalued so that we could uh, draw out some of the equity. And the mm -hmm. valuation that came in was about 30% under market value. <laughs> And when I went yeah. back to the valuer, I said, this is a ridiculous value that you've put on our apartment because I could uh -huh. sell this tomorrow for that price. It's worth way more than that. But I guess they, the banks ask them to price it lower so that it de-risks for them. Yes, uh, and I think with the residential valuations, a lot of those valuations are done what they call um, desktop valuations where um, the data is uh, taken down from places like RP data. And, uh, and at times, there is not even an in, in, uh, internal inspection. Um, so it's not unusual for uh, the values to be um, conservative. And on the residential side, my recommendation is, also, is always for an apartment is get an internal valuation because it's just so difficult. Um, to get the true value when you're just looking at either a desktop or a, or a drive-by um, modelling assessment. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Whereas with the commercial valuations, it's always going to be a site visit. Yeah, okay. But I guess if you're selling off the plan, they're going to have to compare against other similar off the plan properties or recently completed properties to gain an idea of market valuation. So are we talking now the um, off the plan residential? Yeah, the valuer. When they're doing so their valuation about, report. Yeah, so we're talking about the valuation for the commercial development? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they, they certainly do have to look at uh, like, like projects. And that actually comes into when they come, um, when they assess the land as is, land as is valuation, they do that calculation that I spoke about, and which includes a risk component, and then they compare that against recent sales. Yeah. Okay. Um, on the on the residential side, with the off the plan, and this is what is concerning some of the lenders now. When I talked earlier about the settlement risk, is that um, lenders will require a valuation done of the unit um, that I've purchased, um, and that valuation is not done until until practical completion. So if property values have reduced or indeed the banks have said, look, I'm a bit nervous about this particular suburb, um, the valuations could come in at less than the original contract price and that is one of the concerns yes, at the moment. And that's what happened in, in 2013, 2012? Yeah. But that was across the board with house and land well, it, packages. Yeah, it's happened and, a number of occasions now yeah. over the years. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, then you'd be pretty nervous if your if your stock dropped in value by ten or fifteen percent or more between starting construction and completion. Well, I think there is going to be some of that, unfortunately, um, and this is another reason why, with your qualified pre-sales, that you need to have at least ten percent deposit, because if the valuations don't come up and someone's only paid five percent deposit. 
um, they are more likely to walk away. Yes, another very, very good point. Mm. Yeah, well, plus, uh, well, and plus the bank just won't even look at it if you don't have a 10% deposit. Well, the bank, in terms of one of the um, conditions in development funding, um, a qualified pre-sale requires 10%. But that's one of the changes that's happening in the development funding. I mean, at, um, when we were um, when we put your financing package together, it was seventy five percent debt cover. Um, whereas now um, there are transactions that it needs to be one hundred and twenty percent debt cover. Oh wow! Well, yeah, I think our, uh, the bank indicated to me the other day that if we made the loan today, it would be one hundred percent debt cover. Yeah, at least 100, and there's quite a number that it's 120. 120, so that means you'd have to put in more money. Pardon? you have to put in more money. No, it's 120% debt cover. What, what that means is that you've essentially got to get all, your, you've got to get all the um, units sold. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so whereas in your case it was only about 50% of them sold, it was 11 out of 20, I think, from memory, wasn't it? Yeah, that fit the... I think we had... Yeah, it was around there, 12 or 13, yeah. I think, we had sold by the time we had the valuation report done. Yeah, yeah, but if you, if for uh, for the lending transactions now that require 120% debt cover, that virtually means that all the units have got to be sold or all the townhouses have got to be sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is... But at least 100% debt cover, you're absolutely right. Yeah, which you kind of get stuck between a rock and a hard place as a developer because... You want to get the project started, which then generates more interest, and you can then get it finished quicker, which means you can realise the, the profit to get it all done and dusted. Well, this is where some of the, the, the smaller specialist development finances are coming into the fore, because they don't require the level of pre-sales that the, that the major banks require, but higher cost of funds. However, um, because of the time frame between um, waiting to get 100% debt cover versus only requiring 50%, for example, um, you know, holding costs is, is money as well. Yeah, there's a big difference, is there, if you can finish six months earlier? Absolutely. So the differential in pricing um, for a, on a total project basis is okay. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's, I think you mentioned that. You've got to look at it holistically now, not just cheapest bank financing at 5% or 6%, maybe a blend of uh, various interest rates that works out at 9 or 10% across the life of the project. Yep, exactly. Or the construction phase at least. Yes. And so speaking of lending products that are being created, do you think there's going to be a growth or some potential for funds to appear from superannuation funds from all these high net worth individuals or not even necessarily high net worth but there's such a huge amount of funds or money in superannuation funds. Do you reckon some mm -hmm. of that might start finding its way into development funding vehicles or pools? Yeah, I think so and it already is in some of the larger developments we're talking and talking about and when I say larger and it's difficult to actually put a number on it but I think you'd be looking at at least, you know, $50 million projects. Um, you know, superannuation funds are coming in and what they're calling that is stretch senior debt funding, um, where, it, where the funding is provided by the superannuation funds. The other thing um, that is starting to come to the fore is uh, financiers that will come in and provide finance against residual stock. So say, for example, um, you sold 15 um, of your 20 townhouses, but you wanted to move on to your next project. And, and rather than pushing to get the other five sold, um, a financier will come in. And if your, uh, your existing senior bank debt financier won't do it, um, you've got these players that will come in and say, OK, then we will lend um, up to 65% against these remaining five units, um, which will give you the equity to then go into your next project. Mm, so they will give you, what, 65% of the value of the last five units? Yeah. that's yeah. And, they, and they take ownership of them? That's right, yeah. Oh, that's 
potentially a uh, well, it's a great deal for the people that are buying them, but I guess if you're happy to get on and get out, then it works for you as well. No, no, no. What, no, what I mean by that is um, it's residual uh, residual stock finance. Sorry, residual stock finance. So, say for example, um, in um, with with your development, um, say you ended up with five townhouses, you, you actually had repaid your development finance, yep. but you had five townhouses that you still haven't sold, but you've got your next project that you want to move on to. The first step for you is we would go to your existing financier and say, okay then, will you provide me finance against this re remaining five? So that's so will you your profit, basically. Your profit. Exactly. Yep. Will you give me an investment loan yep. um, against those? Um, and then you would use those funds to then go to your next project. So it is a loan. It's not you selling ah, okay. um, yep. those those. Yeah. Okay. Um, but some sometimes the commercial financiers are saying, well, look, we're in for the development finance. We're not interested in the hold finance. And so this is where some of the niche players are saying, okay, there's going to be some residual stock in these developments and developers want to move on to their next project so they actually develop these type of uh, funding structures to enable that to happen. Ah, and mm, what kind of uh, costs I guess are involved with doing something like that? Um, look, the interest rates are probably going to be around 8 to 9, something yeah. like that. Um, and your upfronts, I'd say you'd be looking at around about two, two and a half percent. And typically, with with transactions like that, um, there is mandate fees payable, so a mandate fee of probably about ten thousand dollars, something like that, to actually say, okay, then, you know, I want you to put this structure together for us. So you have to pay your ten thousand before anything happens. Mm -hmm. And then, as you sell off the stock, you just pay down the. That's right. Yep. Yep. Uh, see, don't you love the finance industry? They just come up with a product to solve a problem. Well, you know, and it's in interestingly, it's not the um, it's it's always the niche players that come up with these. Um, well, let's call them innovations. I'm not sure they really are, but um, infill, <laughs> infill uh, funding. Oh, I'm just wondering the people that sit there coming up with the numbers on these. How do we how do we make money on this? Yeah. <laughs> crunch the numbers and here we go. There's a package mm. here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess it all comes down to, as a developer, what you're prepared to pay to either to get it done and move on to the next project. Well, that's right. I think it just comes back to um, had you got your next project. Um, and of course, the ideal scenario with a developer is to have. Um, projects in each section, you know, one in the construction, you know, a, a project in the construction, a project in the planning, a project in the um, finding, if you like, and you need equity for that. And this is one way you can do it. Um, there's other options of what they call equity redraws on, um, on, your, on an existing project, but that's reliant on an, an equity provider coming in. But that's quite interesting as well. Oh, it looks like we're going to have to have another uh, <laughs> get you back on the show another time, Gail, and go through all of these other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's fascinating, really. Yeah. So, Don't worry, I'm learning as I'm going as well. Oh, good. So, well, it's uh, healthy to keep learning. So, Gail, if people would like to find out more or talk to you about some of their funding needs, where can they get you? Uh, they can email to Gail G A Y L E at stapletonpacific.com. Fantastic. Well, I guess if people go back and listen to the previous episode that we did together, they'll find out that you are a senior bank executive with a hell of a lot of experience. So uh, you would certainly look after them. Thank you. Well, we might uh, leave it there for this episode of the Property Developer Podcast. As always, fascinating to talk to you about finance and funding options that are available for developers out there. Pleasure. Always good to talk to you as well, Justin. Thank you so much for being on the show and we'll talk to you soon. Pleasure. Thanks, Justin. See ya. Bye-bye.
Okay, there you go. Another good conversation about finance and project funding. It certainly is a moving feast when it comes to development finance, with lenders changing their appetite and amending their selection criteria all the time. And I think that is why a finance specialist can really help you stay aware of where the lending market is at and how to obtain the best deal. Here are a couple of things I took away from our chat. One, consider a higher cost of capital. You may need to start factoring in higher capital costs when doing your project feasibility. With major lenders tightening their lending parameters, you may be forced to use a blend of different debt types and paying higher interest rates. And considering interest rates were above 7 and 8% not many years ago, paying those kinds of rates should be viewed in the broader context of what you are trying to achieve with your developing. Do you want to get in and out faster? Or are you happy to complete a project, wait for it to all settle, and then go again? Two, look to engage a quantity surveyor and valuer to help with your initial project feasibility. Gail spoke about making your project bankable, which means ensuring that your total revenue and total development costs stack up. Having an early indication about this can let you know whether you are skating on thin ice or have sufficient margins to weather a drop in values or increase in costs. And often you can use a firm that is part of the panel of approved consultants that the banks look to engage when they are assessing your funding application. So you can get out in front of that process. Three, contemplate what you would do if a lender required higher debt coverage or introduced other hurdles. I have come to understand that banks are in the business of making money through selling money and they really hate losing money. Hell, don't we all? So they will do pretty much anything to reduce their risk. That means at any point in time they can change their lending criteria, tighten loan conditions and even call in loans early. This means they may make it really hard for you to get funding, for example by requiring 100% debt coverage rather than 80% or as Gail mentioned maybe even 120% debt coverage. This may slow down your ability to get construction started and thus finish your project and get paid. You may need to figure out whether paying higher costs to get access to funds quicker is worth it for the time you save to complete your project and move on. You should be able to work with a good finance specialist or broker to figure out these scenarios. There are always options for getting capital, they just come at a cost. If you are needing help with getting your finance sorted for your next project, then consider getting in touch with Gail and see if she can help you out. Okay, that's another show almost done. I hope you got something from it. I certainly did. Head over to the Property Developer Podcast website for previous episodes or to leave a comment. You can find that at propertydeveloperpodcast.com. Join me on Instagram at Property Developer Podcast, where I post my Property Developer Porn Picks, or head over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. Thanks again for listening in, and until next time, remember the golden rule. Whoever holds the gold makes the rules. You've been listening to the Property Developer Podcast. Tune in next time for more tips, ideas, and inspiration to take your developing to the next level. For more developing love, make sure to visit propertydeveloperpodcast.com.